Our top story tonight, tempered down the rate cut expectations. A Macquarie note quotes an RBI official raising the red flag on inflation. The central bank expects inflation to accelerate before coming under control. Also strikes a note of caution about rising crude prices and a possible below par monsoon. The second lead today, nearly 1,300 people who sold the land for Mumbai uh, for Navi Mumbai development set to face the tax heat. The income tax department will send notices to demand tax on short-term capital gains made by selling projects to developers. That's an exclusive. In other headlines, Andhra Pradesh will unveil its master plan for its new capital, Amravati, in the first week of June. The state will pump in 2 lakh crore rupees over the next five years to build that new city and Jaipur is gearing up for a smart makeover. Cabinet eases the foreign direct investment rules for non-resident Indians, person of Indian origin and overseas citizens of India. The move is aimed at boosting capital inflows into the country. On the ground, still a lot more needs to be done if we need to attract investments in. KPMG's India head is not impressed with the first year of the Modi government. Richard Reiki says the centre missed chances to make big bang reforms despite many opportunities. But our daughter posts weak operational performance in the fourth quarter. Revenues, profits, margins, exports all see a sharp decline. But the company is optimistic of a better showing in the days to come. More job aspirants knock on the doors of Infosys. The company sees a 50% jump in job applications. The company also added nearly 12,000 more employees in FY15 compared to FY14. And on the hour for you today, Mercedes-Benz launched its fully armoured sedan, the S600 Guard. The car comes at a starting price of, hold your breath here, nearly 9 crore rupees. Well, it's not something you will see every day. An Indian Air Force Mirage fighter landing on the Delhi Agra Yamuna Expressway. That's right, the jet touched down on the highway. The Air Force carried out the exercise to use national highways for emergency landing. So this was a test flight. Good evening. Welcome to India Business Hour. Hi, Kritika. Hi, Shireen. But, you know, if you had to choose, what would you prefer? A Mirage jet or the 9 crore Merc sedan? Kritika, I have to say that I'm the daughter of a fighter pilot. My <laughs> loyalties lie with the air warriors. It will always be a mirage. Why not both other. of them? Why not both of them combined to yeah. sure. I, I so sure, I'm fine with both. I'm fine with both, but you know, unfortunately, can't afford the Merc, can't afford a fighter jet either. But let's talk about the market action now. After some wild swings over the last two sessions, it was a day of consolidation on the last three. The major indices were stuck in a narrow band and ended the day with marginal losses. The Nifty lost about two points, so very, very flat. Finally, at the finish, trading above the 8,400 mark. The Sensex also saw minor losses and remained within the striking distance of 28,000. Mid-caps had a tepid day as well, ended with losses of about 17 points for the index, so a flat close for our market. Staying with the market, investors' faith in India currently a little fickle, and that is the word coming in from City. The influential brokerage has also cut its Sensex target for the year. The target now stands at 32,200, that is by this December, and that's about 800 points lower than its previous estimate. And all all of these things did their bit to weigh down the bulls in trade today. But what about the rupee and crude, Kitika? We've uh, wrapped up the equity market action. Well, the rupee has had a good day today, Shireen. So the domestic currency opened stronger against the dollar and pretty much maintained its lead through the day. The spike came even as the American greenback weakened against its global peers. Following the release of the U.S. Federal Open Market Committee minutes, the minutes in fact expects, expressed some concerns over the strength of the dollar and stopped short of giving an indication on the timing of a likely interest rate hike. And now let's turn our attention to the oil market then. Crude prices are rising as we speak. Brent crude is up over 2%, slightly above the $66 mark. And WTI NYMEX crude is hovering around the $60 level. Shireen? Well, let's go straight to the big story tonight. 
temper down all the rate cut expectations. That is, if you believe a Macquarie note sent out to its clients. The note says that the Reserve Bank does not believe that the inflation battle has been won. The note quotes an RBI official as saying that the jump in crude and oil prices and a below normal monsoon pose upside risks to inflation. The RBI official also admits that the pace of recovery will be slower, but he asserts that inflation will head upwards before easing. Ritu joins us now with the details. Ritu, what more does the Macquarie note say? And striking a very cautionary note there as far as the possibility of rate cuts this year. Well, Shamin, the odds of RBI keeping interest rates on hold in its June policy at least have definitely gone up. In fact, the Macquarie report you pointed out has quoted an RBI uh, official saying that risks to inflation are on the upside. And this is thanks to a rebound in global crude oil prices and also a below normal uh, monsoon. So the RBI is expecting CPI inflation to remain benign at least for the next two to three months. And this will be on the back of the lower food prices, but also the base effect that will play out. But compared to the previous analysis, there's one thing for certain and which is that RBI feels that the risks to inflation have increased. In fact, it, uh, it expects the CPI inflation to firm up to 5.8% by the end of this year. Remember, uh, RBI had set its CPI inflation threshold at 6% uh, for the entire fiscal. Uh, therefore, it uh, fears that growth may be adversely impacted if inflation breaches that level. And on the growth front, in fact, RBI has also raised concerns saying uh, while it maintains its target of 7.8% growth for FI16, it says there is also uh, the recovery which will happen will be very gradual and it will also have a downward bias. So while the RBI is saying that the policy rates right now are appropriately positioned, it also maintains that any further movement, of course, like it always says, will depend on data points. So to sum up, given these risks and given that Raghuram Rajan being the inflation warrior that he is, he may just keep interest up, uh, policy rates on hold, at least in the second June policy. I've been amused with your term inflation warrior all day long. Thanks for breaking up that story for us. But moving on to an exclusive, the income tax department is going all out to widen its tax net. Its new target, Project Affected People or PAP, who are mostly farmers of the Navi Mumbai region. CNBC TV 18 exclusively learns that the income tax department will soon issue tax notices to nearly 1,300 people affected for the gains that were made on selling developed land allotted to them by Sitco. Prena joins in now with the exclusive details. Prena, what are you picking up? And also, more importantly, what are the options that these people have now? Well, that's right. You know, Kritika, the tax department is now targeting these 1,300, uh, uh, you know, project-affected people who sold the land that was granted to them by Sitco, and they sold this piece of the land to back to the developers. So clearly, the tax department is uh, looking to tax uh, these, uh, you know, the short-term uh, capital gains that were made on these transactions. And as we understand, the tax department is looking uh, to raise a tax demand amounting to about 300 crore rupees by tax these project affected people in the Navi Mumbai area. Now remember the Sitco had uh, given about 12.5% of the total developed land to the project affected uh, uh, people of the Navi Mumbai area in order to develop uh, that entire area. So clearly as we understand as per the tripartite agreement which means the agreement entered by Sitco, the project affected people and uh, the developers as per which uh, the land which the, uh, the project affected people received from Sitco, they had an option to set it back uh, to the developer and the profit that they earned from this transaction is clearly which the tax department is looking to uh, you know tax these people also to talk on this we had uh, you know pair of the lal of pwc who shared his view uh, views on this matter the income tax authorities do have a right to kind of look into all the transactions that happen in the country so as such they have been doing uh, the the uh, review of all such transactions. So in a way, it's, it's a trend which is already there. I, I don't think so. It's, it will set a negative trend. I mean, they, they are in the rights of doing what they're doing. All right, moving on to news from the capital. India's cabinet has paved the way for greater foreign remittances and investment into the country. It has approved amendments to the FDI policy on investments by non-resident Indians, persons of Indian origin and overseas citizens of India. CNBC TV is Ritu Parna Bhuyan, who has been tracking that story, joins in now with the details. Ritu, what does this mean going ahead? Well, there are two uh, changes uh, that has been made in the FDI policy related to NRI investments. Firstly, the definition of uh, the, uh, the term NRI that has been expanded to include uh, OCIs, uh, 
as of now NRIs and uh, person uh, people of Indian origin that is PIOs that is included but OCI is uh, uh, that is a new category which has been included uh, under the definition of NRIs the second and the more important uh, change that has has been, has been made is that uh, NRI investments have been bought at par with uh, domestic investments and as a result uh, NRI, uh, the category of NRI investors will now not have to worry about uh, caps uh, uh, in sectors like say defense or insurance or pension because their investments uh, will be not counted uh, for the FDI cap uh, uh, before uh, this change that, that was made uh, their investments were counted uh, for the composite cap for example in, in insurance or even in, in pension but uh, uh, after today and once the press note is actually released uh, NNI investments in sectors with, with caps will not be counted for the FDI cap. Uh, this move, according to the government, is expected to lead to enhanced uh, uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, inflows into India, both through the FDI route as well as uh, uh, repatriation. Uh, and and uh, according to the government, this is in, is in, is in sync with uh, Prime Minister Modi's, uh, uh, Modi's uh, uh, you know, vision of uh, giving equal economic rights to both uh, to, to, to analyze as, uh, and making them at par with those uh, uh, in, 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 in India. With that, it's back to you. And it, I can see it's really dark out there. I'll let you go at that. Uh, more policy news then. Even as a standing committee of the Rajya Sabha deliberates a constitutional amendment bill for the goods and services tax, the states of Delhi, Punjab, Haryana and Himachal Pradesh today agreed to usher in a uniform tax rate to develop a common market. Now, press released by the Delhi government today stated that it has been felt that due to huge variance in tax rates, Delhi and its neighboring states are witnessing a loss of revenue. Since VAT is a major source of revenue of these states, uniformity of taxes is essential to safeguard revenue. End quote. Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand and Jammu and Kashmir have also been invited to join this initiative. In fact, speaking of states, Shireen, a big story coming in from Andhra Pradesh. Well, let's go to the CNBC TV 18 special report now. In nine years from now, Andhra Pradesh will have a new capital city. Although Amravati, that's what it's been christened, will formally become Andhra's capital in the year 2024. An elaborate transition has already begun. From shifting 20,000 state government employees to constructing a capital city from scratch, the TDP-led government of Andhra Pradesh has set itself some ambitious targets. Jude Sun travels to Hyderabad to get a sense of Chandrababu Naidu's mega plans. In Hyderabad, it's a case of home away from home for the Andhra Pradesh Secretariat. By the year 2024, Hyderabad will cease to be the de jure capital of Andhra and these government employees will move nearly 300 kilometers south to a new capital city. A complete master plan of the new capital, Amaravati, is expected to be ready by the 1st of June. This in keeping with the Andhra government's plan to move administration out of Hyderabad over the next two years. Essentially, this means that 20,000 government employees could shift base from Hyderabad to Amaravati before 2017. By first week of June, we will have the master plan of the entire cap the seed capital, the core capital, the capital region and the capital area, the entire thing. Then we will start building and I think the core capital we are planning to complete before the next elections, that is before 2019. 2019 we will have everything that administratively a capital needs to have. Building this core area alone is expected to cost the Andhra Pradesh Exchequer nearly 20,000 crore rupees, a large chunk of which the state hopes will be funded courtesy of Chief Minister Chandra Babu Naidu's recent investment blitzkrieg. The AP government has already announced an investment target of 2 lakh crore rupees for the next five years. Recent investment deals with energy, tech and pharma majors like Suzlon, Zayomi and Mylan, totaling to nearly $12 billion, could go a long way in achieving that target. While the Singapore government is currently aiding Andhra Pradesh in drawing up Amaravati's master plan, CNBC TV 18 learns that the new government is in talks with consortiums from Japan, China and South Africa to begin construction. When completed, Amaravati's core capital area will span across 33,000 acres pooled in from 31 surrounding villages. But the challenge still remains in moving thousands of families to a whole new city, a move that has already begun but in phases. As far as possible, we are trying to relocate our heads of department there. And uh, some, of the, some of the ministries are 
ministers are also functioning largely from that area. For instance, our, our education ministry is largely functioning from there, and other ministers are largely fun functioning from there. And our chief minister is also making very frequent trips to the state. The focus now shifts to the new capital where the AP government plans to kickstart construction on June 6th. With Prime Minister Narendra Modi in attendance, the journey towards building a whole new capital city is all set to get a lot more exciting. In Hyderabad, this is Jude Sanat. Well, from Hyderabad now to Jaipur, with the cabinet clearing the government's smart city mission in April, states are putting together the blueprint for individual cities to get connected. The Vasundra Raja led BJP government in Rajasthan is putting its best foot forward. While Ajmer has been identified as a future smart city, the Jaipur Development Authority, in collaboration with Cisco, is working on giving the pink city a smart makeover. CNBC TV 18 Shweta Kothari gets you more. The tourist hotspot and soon Jaipur can claim to be one of India's connected cities under the Smart City Initiative. The Jaipur Development Authority intends to set up digital infrastructure to strengthen law enforcement, improve traffic management and give citizens access to free Wi-Fi in special zones. Partnering with Cisco, JDA hopes to transition Jaipur into a smart and connected city in phases. The vision is to have a master plan in place and the appropriate strategy in place in the next two to three months' time. We've already um, invited bids for the consultant and we've already set up a task force which cuts across various departments. They are going to sit together and uh, develop this master plan and uh, we hope that by the, uh, by the July end or the mid-August we'll be having this master plan ready. Not just Jaipur, Rajasthan is hoping to position at least four to five cities as smart cities with Ajmer being on the top of the list. The government of Rajasthan has inked an MOU with the United States Trade Development Agency to collaborate on Ajmer. The central government has also set up a task force to examine the plans for the city. Ajmer has already been declared as a smart city, one of the smart cities. I believe about three more cities of Rajasthan will be included into it. Jaipur will be one of them. Possibly there can be Jodhpur and Udaipur also. I believe in coming years we will be trying to convert four or five cities of Raipur into smart cities. The Jaipur plan is a win for US MNC Cisco as it hopes to leverage its global experience of working on almost 90 smart city projects to convince the government of India and various states of its credentials. Cisco is uh, playing a role of technology advisor to Jaipur uh, Development Authority. The announcement which you saw today is a, is a first showcase and it looks like that it is one of the first uh, state capitals which is going ahead and doing this. And uh, we have began with uh, four applications. That's what I, we, uh, the minister announced as well. Uh, one is uh, Wi-Fi. We have done information kiosk. Uh, there is environmental sensors around. And there is a uh, very intelligent safety and surveillance system which has been deployed here. The government has allocated 48,000 crore over the next five years for the smart city project. But the success of this plan will depend on private sector participation and innovative revenue generation models to ensure each city is self-sustainable in the long run. In Jaipur, Shweta Kotari. While the Modi government has missed the chance to make Big Bang reforms a reality in this, in spite of there being ample opportunity. That is the word coming in from Richard Reiki, the India CEO of KPMG. In an exclusive chat with CNBC TV 18's Ritu Singh, Reiki says the government could have pushed for bigger things, but it did not do so. This even as he lauds the government for getting the small things right. He also says that the mat issue was unnecessary and could have easily been avoided by the government. On the ground, still a lot more needs to be done if we need to attract investments in. And this is visible by seeing that over the last uh, one year, uh, the amount of foreign, in there's no major foreign investment that has come in. While people have committed a lot of money, but nothing has come on the ground. Uh, but, uh, you know, a country as large as India takes time to actually get right, and uh, it may take uh, some time to uh, get it right. So if you ask me, I would say the Modi government has done a good job, but a lot more still needs to get done on the ground. Could you highlight a little more on what more needs to be done in terms of policies? Because we've seen a slew of announcements. Now, what more is required of him right now? Also, when you talk of uh, ease of doing business, uh, how much of an improvement have you seen over the last one year itself? 
So we have been working with some state governments because please understand the ease of doing business not just central is also state. We have seen a number of state governments actually working towards uh, making it easier to do business. But the challenges before investors are what? They are tax and regulations which still continue to haunt them every time something other comes to hit uh, everybody. And we have not actually honestly seen any uh, big bang reform. Now when I say take a big bang, I mean we had an opportunity. India is sitting at a time when it can actually take advantage of where it is uh, because uh, the ecosystem is right everything is right the government is in majority we could push a lot of things together uh, i believe we could have pushed something more which could have been pushed faster than what it was so one of these big hurdles again the mat issue which has been at the forefront now that cbdt has clarified that it won't be applicable to fresh cases uh, what will happen to the fbi as we've moved the court uh, that is now in the court, so we don't know what's going to happen, but uh, this was, in my view, an unnecessary issue that got created. It could have been resolved because there was an announcement in the budget. One could have just said Matt is not applicable. We didn't need to say not applicable from 1st April. I think that triggered off a lot of things. Uh, but, um, uh, I mean, this, at the moment, one cannot say where this will go. Well, to discuss the performance of the Modi government over the past 12 months, joining us now is the President of the Confederation of Indian Industry, Sumit Mazumdar. Sir, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. One thing is absolutely clear, and that shows up in the poll that CNBC TV 18 has conducted across CEOs, and I know that CII does its own dipstick surveys as well, that business confidence has changed, the mood is decidedly different, but in terms of fresh investments, uh, there isn't any move towards fresh investments just yet. Do you believe that that is because of a lack of confidence or do you believe that we're actually suffering from excess capacity and hence no fresh investments? I don't think either one, I, I don't believe either one of the answers are correct because the fresh, fresh investments will come. What the Modi government has been busy or has very rightfully been occupied with doing is uh, uh, creating the foundation, the structure and the environment to bring in fresh investments. The mood is definitely upbeat once all, once all the reforms are in place and things are in place, uh, we will definitely see the investments coming, whether it's domestic or international. There is a lot of interest, but it's just that mm. the government has been busy in setting the uh, correct foundation for a sustainable growth. So what will be the triggers that will finally translate excitement and enthusiasm into actual investment? Because you said the government has been busy trying to lay the, the structural framework, but what is it going to take to actually get uh, investors and domestic Indian companies to start investing? I, I, I do believe that as far as international companies are concerned, let me tackle one at a time. International companies are concerned, we've got to make some more progress on the ease of doing business. Because of historical mm -hmm. reasons, you know, we don't enjoy the best of reputation as a place easy to do business. So the ease of doing business would be a major me measure for this. As far as domestic companies are concerned, I do believe that the demand needs to pick up a little more as the economy picks up. And as the economy picks up, demand picks up, the investments will automatically come. In terms of the economic revival and what this government has done to try and restart the economy, do you believe that enough has been done or do you believe in order to boost both investment demand as well as consumption demand a lot more could have been done? Because that seems to be the one area of disappointment that at least our poll is showing up that the maiden budget didn't really deliver on its promise of growth as much as one would have liked it to. You know, I'm sure there are reasons why your poll is showing that, showing that but I, I, I would tend to disagree. The reason being very simple, because you cannot have results, the kind of results the people were expecting, or even the people were given the impression that they will see in one year. It, it is absolutely impossible and it is unrealistic. If you, if you, you know, really apply your mind and think about it, uh, what has happened, uh, uh, perhaps has happened, uh, perhaps this is the only government that I've seen achieve as much in one year. Sure, a lot more was promised, that hasn't come through, but that will come through. One has to be patient and we will see the results because directionally and fundamentally we are on the right path. Uh, as I started by saying, I know that CII conducts quarterly dipstick surveys uh, of its own members. At this point in time, what is the mood within CII? Uh, what are they saying in terms of what has been the most significant achievement of this government as far as the reform agenda is concerned? Uh, the mood, mood, mood is upbeat, mood is positive, 
that all all our surveys are showing showing that you know things are going to change, things are happening for the best. And what what has been significant has been you know the Make in India program, which has really been a very significant program that has been introduced. Because once the Make in Make in India program takes off, a lot of the ails of our country will be addressed. A unemployment, B lack of skills because there's a lot of emphasis on skills development and and of course poverty so it'll address a lot of things and it'll change the entire uh, uh, face of the uh, our country uh, let me ask you about land acquisition because uh, I know that industry has been batting for a more simple, less complex land acquisition law. Uh, but the ordinance in its current form, uh, does industry believe that this is the right approach? Do you believe that there should be more changes uh, brought in to try and bring back consent in some form or fashion? And if this ordinance is not converted into legislation in the next session of parliament as well, how much of a setback is it going to be? You know, as far as the land, land acquisition bill is concerned, let me clarify. It is really doesn't, doesn't affect the private, private sector for the industry that they set up. It is more land for, for uh, projects of national Government, importance yes. for, for housing and things like that. And you know, I, somehow I've, I've failed to understand how it is called anti-farmer. Because you, the price, price being offered is four times the market price. And if that is not fair, I don't know what is fair. I would obviously like to see the land bill go through. And, uh, you know, one hopes for it. And one hopes that all parties concerned would see the sanity of the whole bill and would support it. My final question to you, infrastructure bottlenecks, de-bottlenecking, whether it's roads, ports, shipping, highways, uh, power, uh, electricity generation, and so on and so forth. Do you believe that uh, enough talk has been translated into action. Of course, the big milestone achievement there has been the coal auction, uh, which has gone off successfully, at least the first phase has. But beyond the allocation of natural resources through auctions, do you believe that enough has been done to de-bottleneck the infrastructure mess? No. Uh, unfortunately, the, the bottleneck that the infrastructure uh, uh, space is facing now is a, is a very complicated bottleneck. It's not a very, it, it doesn't have a simple solution. Because according to the prior system of infrastructure building, the private, private entities had to acquire the land themselves. They had to get the environment clearance themselves. And obviously they, they couldn't predict the exact costing based on how long it would take them to get the land. So a lot of these contracts went, went sour, went south. A lot of contracts have been, redu have, have been returned. Unfortunately, the companies that have been doing this business have very stressed balance sheets. So until these issues are, are handled, who is going to do the job? And this is something that the government is well seized with. They have come up with this recent announcement that after two years of completion of the project, they will have an exit route. But of course, you know, for an exit route, you need a buyer who is going to invest in that also. So it's not an easy one, but I know the government is very well seized of it and is working to find a quick solution. Okay, so my final question to you, uh, what is the big priority that you would like the government to address uh, now that it's completed a year in office, it's found its feet uh, and it's hoping to move forward on the promises it's made? My priority for, as far as the government is concerned is, you know, whatever they're doing on ease of doing business, they need to do much more and, and this is what will change the whole business scene in India. All right, uh, so we will have to leave it there. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18 with your thoughts on the one-year performance of the Modi government in office. Well, here is some good news from the CNBC TV 18 stable. We continue to be ahead of the pack. In the last week, CNBC TV 18 has had a dominating lead with a 62% viewership across India with our closest competitor managing only a 25% market share. Once again, thank you to our viewers for staying with the market leader. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. We will pick up on all the action from all of us here. Goodbye. Many thanks for watching.